on your mood, on your focus, on your reaction time. And what if that same thing, if you kept doing it, could actually prevent diseases like depression, incurable diseases like, depre like uh, dementia and Alzheimer's disease? Would you do it? Yes. 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 Okay. <laughs> so I am talking about physical activity. We're here surrounded in this space with wonderful exercise equipment. It is using this exercise equipment that is one of the most transformative things that you can do for your brain today. Why? Because physical activity has immediate, long-lasting, and protective effects on your brain that can last your entire lifetime. So what, what I want to do in the next uh, 40 minutes or so is tell you about how I essentially did an experiment on myself. I used my deep understanding of neuroscience and how the brain works uh, to discover the transformative effects of physical activity on the brain. And so, of course, our theme today is the brain, our star is the brain. And um, I just want to remind you that the brain is, can I have that chair? The brain is the most complex structure known to humankind. We all have one in our heads, we don't think about that. Think about that for a second. The brain is the most complex structure known to humankind. It defines how we see, feel, touch, taste, uh, think about the world. It um, helps us dis helped us discover DNA, uh, the breast cancer gene, radioactivity, all things discovered by female brains, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, as we're talking about the brain, it's, it's important to have a visualization. And we didn't have a screen today, so I thought, uh, because my lab is just a few blocks away, that I would bring a real preserved human brain for you to see. This is hard to see. So this is a real preserved human brain. It's been in my lab since I've been at New York University, 21 years. Her name is Betty. Um, and uh, just to show you, um, just to give you a quick tour, this is the front of the brain. Prefrontal cortex is right behind your forehead. Back of the brain, occipital lobe. That is where primary visual cortex is. If you have damage to the right and left side of the occipital lobe, you are blind. Your, your eyes might work beautifully, but you cannot see without your primary visual cortex. So I'm gonna focus on two brain areas. We can spend months and months going over all the different areas of the brain. The first area I'll focus on is this one right behind your forehead, the prefrontal cortex critical for your ability to focus attention, shift attention, make decisions, uh, keep things in mind in what we call working memory or scratch pad memory, all done right here in the prefrontal cortex. That's area number one. Area number two, if I flip this over, this is the temporal lobe. You have one on the right and you have one on the left. And the other key structure, is a structure that you can't see on the surface. Also, sorry, I should say that the outer covering of the brain, this uh, gyrated structure, is called the neocortex. That is kind of the highest level uh, uh, functioning that the brain allows us to have. There is cortex surrounding um, the temporal lobe, but just below this region of the brain right here is a key structure that I've been studying for 25 years. It's called the hippocampus. The hippocampus is critical for our ability to form and retain new long-term memories for facts and events. It's also the area that's attacked first in Alzheimer's disease. You've heard of plaques and tangles. Those plaques and tangles start first in the hippocampus, which is why the first uh, um, symptoms of uh, Alzheimer's dementia is the memory problems, because you're damaging this area that allows you to form new facts and events. Okay, so those two key areas we'll come back to. I just wanted you to have a visual prefrontal cortex here and hippocampus down here. Did everybody get their picture? This, this brain is very Instagrammable. It's been all around the world. Okay, so. We love your hat books. Thank you. 
Yes, thank you for noticing my hat box. Brain box. Brain box. Okay. New trend. It is. It is. You never know what a lady is carrying in her. How old is that? How old is the how old is the brain that you So the brain was there when I got there 21 years ago at NYU. It's been in formaldehyde all this time, so it, it preserves it very well. I'm not sure. We didn't have uh, information exactly on how long it had been there, and nobody, nobody remembers, so I just take very good care of it. <laughs> okay, so the brain, prefrontal cortex and hippocampus. And um, kind of stepping back to my history, I have always been fascinated with memory how memory works. So how could it be that this one brain structure, the hippocampus, could take a, something that lasts just a moment? Let's say your first kiss that you ever had, or the first moment you held your child, your first child in your arms for the first time. That lasted just a moment. But it could form a memory that could last a lifetime, 60, 70, 80 years. How could that be? We know it's dependent on the hippocampus. How does that work? So when I got to New York University 21 years ago, that's what I was interested in. I wanted to understand how the electrical activity in the hippocampus allowed us to take a, a, a moment's sensory stimulus, <coughs> that sensory stimulus of your first kiss, and create a memory that lasts a lifetime. So what I did was I recorded the electrical activity in the hippocampus as subjects were forming new memories and tried to decode what happened when new memories were formed and what, what different thing happened when something was forgotten. Well, that was really fascinating. I got grants on this, I won uh, uh, research uh, papers, I wrote research papers, I won awards for this, and I could have continued studying how memory worked for the rest of my career. But something happened. I discovered and experienced something that was so profound with the potential to change millions of lives that I literally had to change my research direction. I experienced and discovered the transformative power of physical activity on the brain. And I did it in an inadvertent way. I was about six years into my uh, um, professorship at New York University, trying madly to earn tenure there, a very kind of stressful process. And um, I did nothing but work. I went from, from the lab to my apartment uh, that was just a few blocks away, getting takeout on the way, and gained 25 pounds in that, in that, in that process. Um, I also realized that uh, I stuck my little head out of my little lab at NYU, and I realized I had no friends outside of the lab. I, I was just working so much. I'd moved to New York not knowing anybody, and I didn't know that many more people six years in. And so, didn't quite know what to do about the friends, but um, I decided, I'm going to go on vacation. Let's, let's try and do an adventure vacation, lose some weight. So I went on a, a river rafting trip to Peru, and I discovered that I was the weakest one on the whole trip. And so that even made me feel even worse. And I came back, and I joined the gym right after I got, got back. And something stuck. I started going to the gym. I discovered I loved it. I all, loved all the exercise classes. Um, there's one in particular that I got uh, addicted to at the gym that kept me coming back. It was an uh, exercise class called Intensati. Anybody here of Intensati? So it, it combines physical movements from kickbox and dance and yoga and martial arts. So instead of just punching back and forth, you say things like, I am strong now. And you know, the first time I went, I felt like a complete idiot because <laughs> it's ridiculous to be shouting out these affirmations. But about halfway through that class, I remember thinking, you know, the people that are really shouting, they don't care whether I'm shouting or not, and they look like they are having so much fun. So I joined in. And I have to say that um, exercise always made me feel good after the class, but shouting positive affirmations made me feel amazing. So uh, a long story, short, long story short, a year and a half later, I'd lost 25 pounds, feeling really good, going to the gym all the time. And then I was sitting in my office, and that's when the big discovery came. I was sitting there doing something that I do all the time, writing an NIH research grant, okay? This usually means that I'm pulling my hair out, I'm miserable, I'm hating life, 
But a thought through, went through my mind that day that had never gone through my mind before. And that thought was, gee, Grant Reddy's going well today. I'd never had that thought before, <laughs> ever. And uh, I thought, wow, maybe I'm just having a good day. What's, what's going on? And um, so uh, when I thought about it, I realized that grant writing was going well because I was able to focus my attention deeper and longer. And my long-term memory for all of those details, I had you know, hundreds of papers on my desk trying to pull together that multi-million dollar NIH hypothesis that would win me that grant. And you need a good memory to remember all the good things and bad things about all these papers. That memory was better. Remember, I'm studying memory back in my own lab, so my own memory was better. And um, I went back to the literature and I realized that there was a growing body of research showing that physical aerobic activity actually had many, many benefits for the brain and all the benefits that I was noticing. First of all, mood. Absolutely uh, uh, many papers showing uh, mood and anxiety uh, decreases, mood increases, anxiety decreases with even a single exercise bout, uh, and other studies showing better focus and better memory. That made me really set up and take notice and made me think, I need to learn about this. This is not my area. This is what I'm going to learn about. And so um, as a professor of neuroscience at an undergraduate institution, I know the best way to learn a new area of research is to teach a new undergraduate class on it. So I decided to develop a new class called Can Exercise Change Your Brain? And I was gonna go through all the history, what we knew uh, uh, early on, what got us into this area, uh, and ending, ending with all the clinical studies showing what the effects of exercise were on the brain. And uh, as I was doing this, I thought, well, this was inspired by me going to the gym. Um, what if I actually bring physical activity into the NYU classroom? I don't think anybody's ever done that in the annals of academic history. Uh, so I went to my administrators and I said, hey, I have a great idea. All you have to do is give me some money. I'm going to hire my favorite instructors from my gym, uh, come and uh, teach us all exercise, and then I'm going to talk about the effects of exercise on, on their brains, on my students' brains, as they experience exercise. Isn't that great? And they said, no. You no, know, there's no extra money for, we pay you to teach, so you know, there's no extra money to pay somebody else to help you teach. So I went back to my office and I thought, well, if they're not gonna pay for an extra exercise instructor, I'm going to the gym, what, five, six times a week? I'm gonna to train to be an exercise instructor to help teach this class. And I went back and I said, I'm going to expand my teaching abilities by take, taking this extra teacher training. Would you pay for that? And they said, yes, we will. I think that's a great idea. So this started the most extensive uh, kind of class development that I've ever had in my, in my career. I did teacher training, um, but you can't teach this class uh, just uh, by taking five days of teacher training. So it was five days of teacher training followed by six months of practicing training. You know, uh, all my friends individually I invited over to my apartment and I taught them the class just to practice. My cat can do intensity really, really well. I saw me do it so many times because I wanted to do it really well. I mean, I was going to be teaching in front of a, a bunch of very um, uh, hard-nosed NYU students. So, um, uh, and of course, during this time, I was reading the literature and learning all about this topic, which was getting me more and more and more interested. And then, somewhere in the middle, I realized, wait a second, I'm gonna have a whole classroom of NYU neuroscience majors exercising more during that semester because I'm making them exercise. What if I make them my first human study on the effects of exercise? All I need is a control class that's also sitting in class for about the same amount of time, but that doesn't exercise. So I went up to my colleague and I said, hey, are you actually making your students exercise during class? And he said, no. And so he let me test his students at the beginning and the end of the semester. And so there I had a controlled exercise study. And so here I was, September 7th, 29, uh, not 2019, 2009, um, and I walk into my Can Exercise Change the Brain classroom for the first time. And there were three things that were quite different. Number one, I was clad head to toe 
in Lululemon because I'm <laughs> teaching an exercise class that's a little bit different from my usual garb for lecturing. Number two, I was really nervous. I do not get nervous talking in front of people, lecturing to classes. No, I enjoy it. I was very nervous because I'd never taught the students an exercise class and I also really wanted them to like it. So um, number three was the students. So it was the first day of the, of the fall semester. Everybody's a little bit excited, you know, don't know what's, what to expect. These students look terrified. I think it was me and my little lemon. They knew they had to exercise, but I don't think they realized that they were going to be exercising with me. And the, you know, the thought of actually sweating with your professor before the lecture start was was um, uh, disturbing to them, I believe. So um, there we were, um, and I wasn't going to know until I actually got up and started teaching the class. But I'll tell you, many things changed that day. Number one, I didn't realize this before I started the class, but what I did by in introducing a whole hour of exercise is I kind of broke down that barrier that usually exists, uh, um, exists between the professor at the, at the front of the classroom and the students in the back. I can tell you that after that class, I got so much more interaction. It was easier for them to ask questions, to kind of generate a discussion than it had been in any of my other classes when I was trying very effortfully to get them to talk. Well, all I needed to do was throw in a little bit of exercise and music and got, got, the, uh, got the conversation going. But more than that, um, what we found at the end of that semester, you know, I was doing a study. What, what did we find? Well, remember, this was just once a week increased exercise. These were high functioning, very healthy NYU students. And even just with one time more exercise a week, we found significant improvements in reaction time in these students, which had been reported in the literature. And all I could think was, what if I can get them to exercise three times a week? What would, what, what would I find then? I found myself thinking more and more and more about the effects of exercise because of this class that was done just to learn something new as an academic, but thinking more and more about the practical <coughs> implications. Because I must say that at the same time that all of this was happening, I noticed the effects of exercise on my own memory, focus, um, uh, mood. Um, I'm teaching this new class, learning about the literature right at this time my father experienced a very precipitous drop in his um, hippocampal memory function. He, um, he drove every, uh, every afternoon about seven blocks away to get his afternoon cup of coffee at 7-Eleven. And he came back one day and told my mom that he couldn't remember how to get home. He had a really hard time remembering how to get home. In fact, one of the forms of memory that the hippocampus is most critical for is spatial memory, that kind of map-like memory, and he knew something was really, really bad. And so it um, was not right with him. So I jumped into action. I found him the best neurologist. But I can't tell you how guilty I felt. I, I was an expert in the hippocampus, in the anatomy, physiology, and function of the hippocampus. And I can't do anything because there's no cure for dementia. There's no cure for Alzheimer's disease. But that's what motivated me even more to understand the effects of exercise. And I'll come back to that idea at the end. So let me tell you what I and others have discovered about exercise and why it is so critical for your brain. Again, I call it the most transformative thing that you can do today for your brain. And there's three reasons. Let's go through them one by one. Reason number one is that exercise has an immediate demonstrable effect on your mood, on your focus, and on your reaction times. That is, even a single workout. We can jump, I can jump on this right now, do a 30 minute workout and test my brain, and I could see improvements in mood, uh, focus, and in reaction time. That's critical because that kind of feedback that you can give somebody, what if you did a workout and um, it was a really hard one, you went to you know, really hard soul cycle class and you feel good about that, about yourself after you finish one of those really hard soul cycle classes. But what if I was gonna be able to tell you that actually improved your mood 
by this percentage and improved your memory by that percentage. That's what we can do with exercise. It is quantifiable. And you might be thinking, well, why? How's it, how does it do that? We don't know all the answers to that. It is a, a range of different um, um, effects, uh, these immediate effects. But the image that I like to give people is that what's happening is every single time you work out, you are changing the neurochemical environment of your brain in a positive way. I call it, you're give, I, I describe it as if you're giving your brain a little bubble bath. What is in that bubble bath? It is neurotransmitters that make you feel good and energized and rewarded. Neurotransmitters like dopamine go up in your brain after every workout. Serotonin um, that, that is decreased in depression goes up with exercise. Noradrenaline, uh, just keeping the brain active and alert, also goes up. Endorphins, the brain's natural morphine, all goes up after, after a single workout. And the other thing that goes up are growth factors in the brain, which are things that help new synapses form. So individual brain cells communicate by um, uh, connections called synapses. And these growth factors are critical to have those new synapses being formed. Brain plasticity is uh, the, the, um, the fact that the environment, what you're doing, you, what you experience in your life can actually change your brain. The majority of the way your brain is being changed is by formation of new synapses, which is why that increase in um, growth factors is so critical every single time you work out. Okay, so immediate effects of brain function are critical. Cool. Giving your brain a bubble bath. Second reason why exercise is so helpful for your brain. Imagine that you give your brain a bubble bath five to seven times a week for years and years in your life. That is, what if you regularly work out and give your brain this wonderful, wonderful environment, including lots of growth factors? Here's what happens. Here's what happens in my favorite structure, the hippocampus. Okay? And this, if you remember nothing more from the talk, remember this. Long-term increases of aerobic exercise stimulate the birth of brand new brain cells in that hippocampus. Okay? Let me say that again. Working out regularly stimulate the birth of brand new brain cells in the hippocampus. It's one of only two brain areas in the entire adult brain where new brain cells are being formed. And let me ask you right now, how many of you would like new brain cells in your hippocampus? Anybody? Yes? Okay, okay. So um, that is what it's doing. Why is it doing it? Because um, the hippocampus has the potential to grow new brain cells. And what stimulates that? growth factors. The more growth factors you have in the hippocampus, the more those new brain cells are going to grow, which is why regular exercise helps new brain cells grow. How does that happen? How does brain, how does, um, how do those uh, growth factors increase? Well, we know a little bit about this. We still have things to learn, but it turns out that moving your muscles, as you do in, in, uh, um, um, in exercise, uh, releases what's called myokines, which is anything, uh, any protein released by a muscle. Some of those myokines go up, they pass into the brain through what's called the blood-brain barrier, and what do they do? They stimulate the release of growth factors. So that's one pathway that growth factors are going up. And they're going up in the hippocampus. There's another pathway as well um, through the liver. So ketone bodies, as you're exercising, are also released by your liver. That's not anything new. People have known this for a long time. But what my colleague at NYU, Dr. Moses Chow, showed is that those ketone bodies, again, pass the blood-brain barrier. And those ketone bodies also stimulate the release of growth factors in the hippocampus. So there's multiple pathways as you exercise that are all coming down to this single function of increasing growth factors in the hippocampus. And in fact, this is consistent with the finding that in a, a group of subjects that were uh, 70 years and above, older, um, three months of increased aerobic exercise actually increased the size of the hippocampus in these older participants. So long-term exercise changes the brain structure. 
I told you about the hippocampus. This is the one thing I want you to remember. Exercise is stimulating new hippocampal growth. And oh, I forgot to tell you kind of the best thing. Those new hippocampal cells, first let me remind you, sorry, step back for a second. Did you realize that every single cell in your brain is a cell that you had when you were born? These cells don't turn over, okay? Uh, which is why, you know, that old uh, uh, saying that, you know, don't, don't kill your brain cells because you don't get uh, uh, any replacements. That's only partially true. You do get replacements, but only in the hippocampus. So here, the hippocampus is unique. It's growing these brand new brain cells. Those new brain cells work better than the old hippocampal brain cells that have been in your brain since you were born. They work better in the sense that they are more excitable. They get engaged in the memory circuits that the, mem that the hippocampus is, is, uh, um, is developing, is, is creating, because that's its function. It creates new memories. And um, so this is why uh, when you give rats, for example, more access to exercise, they perform better on a whole bunch of memory tasks that are dependent on the hippocampus. But the hippocampus is only half the story. The other brain area that is improved with long-term exercise is the prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex is important for decision-making and focus. Um, new neurons aren't born in the prefrontal cortex. Instead, what seems to be happening there are new synapse forming. That's also dependent on growth factors. But also, the outputs of the prefrontal cortex um, are working better. It's able to actually fire faster. And so we have these two brain areas that are particularly strengthened with long-term exercise, the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. That is great. That is what you are doing as you're doing your regular exercise. And I'll add one more factor in there, reminded, um, I was reminded by um, a panel that I participated in yesterday by the Dana Foundation at the JCC. Um, with a um, vascular uh, neurologist. And we know that the other thing that exercise does is it grows new blood vessels in the brain. It's called angiogenesis, new blood vessels in the brain. So the more you work out, the more blood vessels you get in the brain. Now why would, would blood vessels be good for the brain? Why would blood vessels be good for the brain or is it bad for the brain? What do you think? Good, good? Why? Oxygen. More oxygen, absolutely. So the brain is the number one user of oxygen. So the more blood vessels you have bringing that oxygenated blood, the better the brain works. And also as we age, those blood vessels get weaker. Um, uh, you, you, you're susceptible to, more susceptible to vascular disease that is also highly correlated with dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So as you're working out, you're getting a bigger, fatter, fluffier hippocampus, a bigger, fatter prefrontal cortex and more blood vessels. Um, you are also kind of uh, um, helping your brain against stroke that comes with older age. So that is the second reason why exercise is so transformative. You are literally, and I like to uh, use the analogy of uh, the brain is a muscle here. The more you are working out, you are strengthening and increasing the size and the strength of these brain areas. And, um, and this brings me to the third reason why exercise is so transformative for your brain. The third reason might be the most important. It is the protective function of exercise on your brain. I told you, you're growing new cells in the hippocampus, you're growing new synapses in the prefrontal cortex, you're growing new blood vessels. That is protecting your brain against aging and neurodegenerative disease states because the two brain areas that are most susceptible to aging are the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. And the brain area that is most susceptible to Alzheimer's disease is the hippocampus. So what we're doing is we're not rolling back the uh, uh, kind of the uh, rolling back the clock. We're not uh, um, um, doing anti-aging, and we're not curing either aging or dementia or Alzheimer's disease. We are literally making the brain stronger to allow the brain to stave off aging and neurodegenerative disease states better. I like to call it 
the 401k for your brain. So exercise <laughs> is a wonderful 401k for the brain, but it's even better than a 401k because you get those immediate effects. So you don't have to wait until you know way where you're really old to pull all that out of your bank account. You you get those effects immediately. So those are the major functions of um, um, of, of exercise. Those are the reasons why it is transformative. There are immediate effects. There are long-lasting effects on the brain's anatomy, physiology, and function, and it is protective. And so this is the part of the talk where everybody says, that's great, just tell me the minimum amount of time I have to be on these machines to actually get these effects. And here we come to the reason why I wanted to explore not just the research that I do at New York University, but I wanted to explore a product that I could provide. I want to be able to tell you the answer to that question. I want to tell you, for your age, for your fitness level, for your genetic background, what is that best exercise that will maximize your brain function and maximally protect your brain? And yours formula might be a little bit different from yours because you're different, you might be a different age and uh, different backgrounds. And so I realized that we had the capacity to do that because we had our hands on the cognitive tests that were most sensitive to the effects of exercise on the brain. So um, we are in the process of um, starting a new company called Brain Body. And Brain Body um, uh, is quantifying exercise enhanced brain function. That is, you're able to take a fast, fun, two minute cognitive tests before and after the main workouts that you typically do. And we're able to give you immediate feedback on what that workout is uh, enhancing in your brain. Are we seeing the mood effects? Are we seeing the uh, um, focus effects? Are we seeing the reaction time effects? And we're putting all this information into our machine learning build that will ultimately be able to be able to tell you not just what workout, is, is best for your brain today, but what is that regimen that will maximally protect your brain from aging and neurodegenerative disease states? Because we're going to be able to tell you what is that workout that maximally enhances and affects those brain areas that are most susceptible to aging, that prefrontal cortex, that hippocampus. And so um, that is uh, uh, the exciting kind of new direction 